So welcome to today's webinar. If I were to ask you what your greatest concern about anti-dumping and countervailing is, what would you say? Well, I hope that in today's webinar as we go over the basics, I answer a lot of those questions. And if not, we're going to open up the floor and try to get some of these answered here today as well as um, by licensed customs brokers um, after the webinar as well. My name is Tyler Zeichkin. I'm the National Sales and Marketing Manager at TRG, and I've been working in this industry for just over five years, learning all I can about these complex topics. Trade Risk Guarantee, um, we are an insurance agency specializing in international trade. We've been in business since 1991, and we are located in beautiful Bozeman, Montana. Now, we do things a little bit differently. Uh, traditionally in the market, the insurance products that we sell, U.S. customs bonds and cargo insurance, are sold through third parties, like a customs broker or a freight porter. Our business model um, has us selling directly to importers and exporters. And over the past 25 years, we've worked with over 13,000 companies, just like yours, um, to help them grow and save money on some of these very niche insurance products. Throughout the webinar, uh, we'll be monitoring our Facebook page, Trade Risk Guarantee, um, uh, as well as our Facebook group, Trade Risk, or International Trade Professionals hyphen TRG. We'll send you links to both of these after the webinar as well. We encourage you to join and, and come here to discuss with fellow importers and exporters the different things you have going on within your day, as well as to get some of your most common questions answered. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to start off by saying, you know, I've been in this industry for a long time, um, and we're going to present a lot of information here today, but this is just the basics. And so if you ever have any questions, you're definitely welcome to come to us uh, here at TRG, and we can have our team of licensed customs brokers answer those questions for you, as well as going directly to your broker um, who can help you out as well. Um, but in today's webinar, we're going to be covering uh, a few topics here. First, we're going to be talking about what dumping and subsidized exports are. Next, we're going to go into the definition of anti-dumping and countervailing duties. After that, we're going to cover the history of anti-dumping and countervailing in the United States. Um, one of the big, and maybe the biggest portion of the webinar itself, is going to be on the petitions for anti-dumping and countervailing relief. Now, we're going to talk about the investigation process and the determination um, of anti-dumping duties um, and countervailing duties, as well as the administrative review and sunset review process. Okay, so first question, what is dumping? Well, dumping occurs when a foreign producer sells a product in the United States at a price that is below that producer's sales price in the country of origin, their home market. It's either that or at, uh, selling at a price that is lower than the cost of production. So a foreign producer selling imports at prices below American products is not necessarily dumping. So just because a foreign producer can sell a product at less than you would buy it here in the United States from a domestic producer doesn't make the import dumping. It's when the price is below that producer's price in their home market. Subsidized exports are a little bit different. So uh, although related, um, subsidized imports are, are imports from industries and products in which government or foreign governments provide financial assistance to benefit the production, manufacture, or exportation of goods. Now, this doesn't mean just a cash subsidy. Subsidies can take uh, place in many forms, such as direct cash payments, credits against taxes, and loans at terms that do not reflect market conditions. So dumping is rectified with anti-dumping duties, and subsidized exports is rectified with countervailing duties. Let's look at, at the definition of both of those. An anti-dumping duty is a protectionist tariff imposed on foreign imports believed to be priced below market value and causing material harm to the domestic market. Now, both of those conditions must be met, both the price below market value and causing material harm to the domestic market. 
countervailing duties are a little bit different. They are still a protectionist tariff imposed on foreign imports, but these are imports believed to be subsidized by a foreign government and again causing material harm to the domestic market. So those two um, criteria must be met for both anti-dumping duty and countervailing duty to be applied. So it must either be priced below market value and causing material harm or subsidized by a foreign government and causing material harm. So anti-dumping uh, specifically goes back a, a long way. Um, you know, it's something that, that our government has been working on here in the U.S. since the 1890s um, to, to work to rectify the situation. Now initially in the 1890s and all the way up to this Anti-Dumping Act of 1916, the focus of, of legislation was on antitrust and monopolies. It was not specifically about um, the duties themselves, but instead uh, trying not to have monopolized um, uh, industries here in the United States. So um, the first act, the Anti-Dumping Act of 1916, was focused on dumping related to predatory pricing, pricing that would force competitors out of an industry. And it was enforced not through duties, but instead through legal proceedings and criminal proceedings. So a little bit different than how we think about it today, um, the Anti-Dumping Act of 1921, happening five years later, is a little bit closer to how we do it today. And in fact, a lot of the acts that we talk about today are going to be based specifically on this first Anti-Dumping Act of 1921. So this, this was focused instead of on predatory pricing, instead of just the, the discrimination of price. And instead of enforcing it through criminal proceedings and legal proceedings, it was enforced through higher import duties, much like what we see today. The Tariff Act of 1930 may be something you're more familiar with, as this is still um, part of how today's uh, legislation is built. So originally, um, the Tariff Act of 1930 defined anti-dumping and countervailing duties under Subtitle 4. Um, the act itself authorized investigation of unfair competition related to these imports. From there, in 1947, um, the World Trade Organization came together at a United Nations conference um, on trade and employment and came together to, to create an agreement on tariffs and trades called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades, or GATT 1947. Uh, these, these specific negotiations and, and rulings went into effect on January 1st, 1948. Now, the article that they came up with here, Article 6, was based on, US, on the U.S. Anti-Dumping Act of 1921. So it brought it all together from a world perspective um, to keep us all uh, globally on the same page with anti-dumping and countervailing. The laws did change a little bit over time and different parties became involved in the United States of determining anti-dumping and countervailing, but major changes didn't happen again until the Trade Act of 1974. So this expanded the definition of dumping to include home market sales below the average cost of production. Um, this, again, five years later, the Trade Agreements Act of 1979 made the biggest changes overall, and this is where most of how our, our legislation works today was based on this Trade Agreements Act of 1979. So this repealed the Anti-Dumping Act of 1921, and it also revised the Tariff Act of 1930. So it, it got rid of Title IV and was enacted as Title VII of the tar to the tar tariff, tariff Act of 1930. It shortened the time limits on dumping and subsidized export investigations and allowed the use of best information available when foreign firms did not provide requested information. So this brings us back to today, and um, as you may or may not know, anti-dumping start all starts with a petition. So let's talk a little bit about that petition process and how that begins to affect you as an importer. So any interested party may file an anti-dumping, not excuse me, not in, any interested, I'll define interested parties, but an interested party may file an anti-dumping or countervailing duty petition alleging that an industry in the United States is materially injured or threatened with material injury or that the establishment of an industry is materially retarded by reason of imports that are being or are likely to be 
sold in the United States at less than fair value or by reason of imports that are being subsidized by governments of one or more countries. So let's dissect this a little bit. First, what parties can file these petitions? So petitions can be filed by interested parties, including manufacturers, producers, and wholesalers, domestic unions, trade associations, and business associations. In the case of agricultural products, it could be a coalition of agricultural processors, producers, or growers, and it could actually be a coalition of unions or manufacturers or producers as well. These are, are U.S. domestic entities that can file these petitions. Now, the petitions themselves need to, to um, uh, talk about two different things that are going on, those two items that we talked about earlier. Is it dumping or a subsidized export, and does it, pro or does it cause material injury to the domestic market? So what is material injury? It is an injury of consequence or, or importance and it has to be substantial in nature. So this isn't uh, a, a, an injury that would be, oh, well, it makes a little bit of a difference to, to the industry if there's this anti-dumping. It, it has to be a substantial cause. The next piece is the fair market value. And this is, this is talking about that, um, uh, the specifically whether or not those goods are being sold at below what they would be sold in their, in their home country. So... Uh, less than fair market value, value is defined as a price that is below the sales price in the country of origin, that home market. When looking at this data, if that home market data isn't available, you can use a surrogate third, card, third country excuse me, to base your data off of. Now, in the absence of both a home market and third country data, a cost plus profit constructed value approach may be used. Now, all of these are used to prove that the, um, the imports are being sold at a price that is less than the sales price in the country of origin. So when this petition is filed, it is filed jointly between two different U.S. government entities, the U.S. Department of Commerce and the U.S. International Trade Commission. They both have different responsibilities in the petition process when determining if goods being imported should be subject to anti-dumping or countervailing duties. The Department of Commerce determines whether foreign producers are dumping goods or receiving financial assistance to benefit the production, manufacture, or exportation of goods. So they're looking specifically at that portion of it. Is it, is it dumping? Is it a subsidized export? The International Trade Commission is determining whether the domestic industry is suffering material injury as a result of the imports of dumped or subsidized products. So um, they both have these different responsibilities and work together to determine whether or not goods being imported should have a, a tariff imposed for anti-dumping or countervailing. So here's the process of the investigation itself. It's a five-point process starting with an initial investigation by the Department of Commerce. Uh, I'm not going to go over the exact days. They're all listed here, and there are some adjustments that can be made to those um, uh, throughout the process, depending if the company get, or the department gets backed up or not. Um, but I'm going to go through the process itself. For the, so the first part of the process is this initial investigation, and it is by the Department of Commerce. And what they're looking for is an initial indication that foreign producers are either dumping or receiving financial assistance. So they are those subsidized exports. If that does come back in the affirmative, then the U.S. International Trade Commission takes over looking to see whether that dumping or um, uh, subsidized exports is causing material harm. And they're just doing a preliminary investigation to see if that, that harm is happening. If that comes back in the affirmative, it moves back to the Department of Commerce, who does the exact same thing from a standpoint of whether or not the goods um, uh, are receiving financial assistance or being dumped. So if the preliminary investigation from both the USITC and the Department of Commerce comes back in the affirmative, then Commerce will initial their first preliminary determination and ask customs to suspend liquidation of entries and collect cash deposits based on their initial estimate of what a duty rate would need to be. 
So this is that first part of, of the process where your goods are now suspended and start um, ask and, and customs starts asking you for a cash deposit for anti-dumping duty and countervailing duty. The, the process does not stop here, however. Um, it still goes under the investigation to a final determination from both Commerce and the U.S. Um, International Trade Commission. So um, let's look further into that. So from there, it goes back to Commerce to look for the final determination and then back to the USITC for their final determination. If both Commerce and uh, the International Trade Commission make affirmative final determinations of injury, Commerce then issues an anti-dumping or countervailing duty order to Customs and Border Protection. This is based on that final determination. At this point, cash deposits must be made at the rates established in the final determination for all entries of subject merchandise on or after the date of the preliminary determination. So what that means is, is if that you haven't been paying attention, you haven't been filing anti-dumping entries, you haven't been paying these cash deposits, all of a sudden the final determination happens now you are responsible for paying deposits for all of your past entries up to that preliminary determination. So that could be a couple of months that you've had entries that you weren't expecting um, additional duties on that now you need to go back and put cash deposits on. Those entries now are suspended if you didn't cal uh, calculate them that way and it's something that, that is, is completely unexpected for a lot of companies. These entries will remain suspended until the administrative review period. Now that's what we're gonna talk about next. So your goods, you've imported them. You didn't know they were subject to anti-dumping or countervailing. A preliminary determination was made that they probably are. You didn't see it. The final determination was made and now all of your entries from a few months ago that were subject to these, uh, this petition are being suspended and asked for additional uh, deposit on the duty. So when does the, the this is a deposit, when, when does the duty get finalized? Uh, and that's the question for a lot of importers. Um, you see these big anti-dumping duty rates, maybe you see a 30% or a 50% or 100% anti-dumping duty, you weren't expecting it, um, and then you're told it's actually a deposit. It's actually not the finalized duty, but a deposit on the entry itself. So now you want to know, well, when does that, that entry get finalized? When does it become liquidated? Um, uh, gets out of the suspended entries, liquidate my entry, let me know what the final number is, and that happens during an administrative review period. So um, the administrative review period, it usually happens annually. Um, and interested parties uh, must actually request an administrative review annually. Um, if they don't, uh, we'll talk about that here in a second, but interested parties may annually request an administrative review of anti-dumping and countervailing orders. This request must be made in the anniversary month of the publication of the anti-dumping or countervailing duty order. Commerce uses this uh, and makes a determination of the duties to be assessed on specific entries made during the previous 12-month period or longer for that first administrative review period. So, again, using that example, your goods, you didn't know they were subject to anti-dumping or countervailing, you got this additional duty rate, your entries are suspended, you go through this entire process, a year later an administrative review period happens where they actually decide what the finalized duty rate will be. So you made your deposits, they come out with the finalized duty rate, um, during that process they also review um, and establish new cash deposits rates for the next year for each company. So anti-dumping duty is not for a country, it's not for a product, um, although both of those are included, they're looking at specific manufacturers within that as well. Um, so with that, they, they determine what the next rate was going to be, they determine what the rate should have been for the previous 12 months or longer, and then if no review is requested for a particular exporter, entries of that exporter's merchandise will be assessed at the cash deposit rate in effect at the time of entry. So um, if the review process doesn't happen for your manufacturer, 
for your goods, um, then they use that cash deposit rate as the finalized number. Typically, they're going to look at it, revise it, um, and it could be something that you get a refund on your cash deposit or you owe a little bit more significantly more than what you made in that initial cash deposit when they do that, that administrative review. So that's going to happen for a few years, um, the administrative review period every year for a few years. Um, but on the fifth year, um, you, uh, Commerce and the U United States International Trade Commission are going to do a sunset review. So since 1995, Commerce and USITC have been required to conduct a review on the fifth anniversary of the anti-dumping or countervailing order. Um, these are automatically initiated. So 30 days prior to the fifth anniversary, they're going to start this review period, both uh, the USITC and Commerce. And what the review period is for is to determine whether revoking the order would be likely to lead to continuation or reoccurrence of dumping subsidies and material injury. So this is the entire process from start to finish. It starts with a petition from the industry, goes all the way through. Um, Anti-dumping orders are issued, countervailing orders are issued, you're asked to put a deposit down um, until the finalized duty rate is, is uh, calculated, um, which happens during that administrative review period. After the administrative review period, after you know five years later, the sunset review happens and they ask, is this going to continue? And the question is, it really comes down to that product and that industry. And some do, some don't, some manufacturers decide not to, to sell at that low price, some continue to sell at the low price, some products will have anti-dumping, some won't. Um, so it's really important that you know um, what your goods are and if they are subject to, to specific anti-dumping and countervailing duty orders. So we covered a few topics here over the last 20 minutes or so. And it really is just the basics. You can see that this is a very complicated, um, very complex um, part of this industry. Um, it involves multiple departments with the Dep Department of Commerce, um, the International Trade Commissions and Customs collecting duties. Um, and, and it really does, uh, is something that, that you, every importer must understand when bringing in goods into the United States. So we covered a few topics today. Again, those are dumping and subsidized exports anti-dumping and countervailing duty definition, the history of anti-dumping and countervailing duties, um, petitions for anti-dumping and countervailing relief, investigation and determination from the Department of Commerce and the International Trade Commission, that administrative review period, and then the sunset review. Um, I'm sure a few of you are going to have some questions. Here are a few different resources that you can access that are going to help answer a lot of your questions, both from a government or, or legislative um, point of view, as well as a simplified point of view. So I encourage you, after the webinar, to check out all six of these resources uh, and pay attention um, to all of those. Um, we are actually going to hold a continuation of this webinar on March 30th. So that's five weeks from today, exactly the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. And we're going to go more in depth into this topic, um, specifically into discussing how to monitor the open petitions, how to calculate what type of cash reserves you should keep to be prepared for that administrative review period, how to mitigate your business risk, and a lot more. We're going to invite a few licensed customs brokers to be on the call with us to answer some of your more very specific questions. So I encourage you to join us for that. This link here at the bottom, uh, bit.ly slash adcvd hyphen p2 is the link to sign up for that. Um, we're going to be sending that out to everyone as well. Um, and again, this will be the, the more in-depth version of what we talked today. I wanted to take a minute to, to go over what Trade Risk Guarantee is. Again, we are an international trade insurance agency. We work directly with importers and exporters, um, and we've been doing this for 25 years. Um, we've got over 13,000 clients that we work with every day, um, specifically discussing these, these complex topics and helping them navigate through this world of customs. We're an additional resource for them um, uh, with their customs broker and freight forwarder. So, um, our model does help save time and money, um, and our multi-year billing cycles are significantly less usually on the customs bond than what the average would be. Typically, people are paying um, somewhere between 475 and 525 for their customs bond, um, 
we are down to 225 a year uh, with our multi-year pricing on that $50,000 bond. You can continue to work with any broker or forwarder of your choice, and then our in-house claims assistance from licensed custom brokers are going to help you navigate any issues that come along the way. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. It's our goal to, to help educate the import community and make this information as understandable as possible. Um, uh, these are complex topics and when you read the legislation and you read customs and you read all of these items, um, it can be very difficult to understand. So it's our goal to, to simplify this process and specifically give you ways to protect your business. And that is what our next webinar is about. So uh, use any of the information provided uh, to contact TRG. Um, if you have any questions at all, I'd love to, to either chat with you on the phone or, or email back and forth, whatever works for you. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming today. We'll have this webinar quickly and answer as many questions as we can. Thanks again.